Twixkina. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexandre Nicuado. Uh, I'm here with my colleague uh, André Zidemann. Uh, this week, uh, we have a special guest, uh, Laurie Beavis from Daphne uh, Center Art. So, uh, Laurie, if you can present yourself to our audience. I mean, Lori Beavis, Indigenous Cause, Pema Dashka to Yang, Shi Nagoja Wanong, Indojaba, Wawishiki Nododam. My name is Lori Beavis. My source communities are Pema Dashka, Pema Dashka to Yang in the Anishinaabe Moan, meaning the place where the fires move across, now called Rice Lake, and Nagoja Wanong, or place at the end of the rapids, now called Peterborough. Both are located in Ontario. My clan is the Hoof, the Deer People, the Helpers. I'm the granddaughter of Laura Cowie and Bert Jones, Lorena Harris, and Ken Beavis. My parents are Lois and Al Beavis. I was raised on Michisagi Anishinaabe territory at Nogojuan, Peterborough. My paternal family is Michisagi Anishinaabe at Rice Lake, and my paternal family are Irish settlers who came to that territory in 1823 from Kent, County Fermanagh. I'm a guest living and working in Jijoge in the language of the Ganagahaka and Muniang to the Anishinaabe. I'm the executive director of Sandra Dart Daphne, Jijoge's Indigenous Determined Artist Run Center, exhibiting contemporary Indigenous artists. And thank you for inviting me today. Uh, hello, Lori. That's uh, really a great uh, pleasure to uh, have you with us uh, today. Um, Maybe you, we can start by uh, the uh, Daphne Art Center, which is, uh, well, not brand new because uh, it has been uh, operated uh, since a uh, few years, but uh, uh, it's uh, recent, certainly, and it's certainly the premiere also for Montreal to have an artist-run uh, center. So can you present uh, briefly what what exactly is uh, the uh, Daphne Art Center? Well, how about I? I, I'll, I'll, I don't usually. I won't read it, but I will. Or I will read this, but I don't usually read things. But um, our mission statement speaks of doing things in a good way. Centre Dar Daphne is a non-profit Indigenous artist-run center committing to ser committed to serving the needs of emerging, mid-career, and established Indigenous artists through exhibitions and associated programming, workshops, residencies, and curatorial initiatives. Daphne encourages a culture of peace through critical, respectful exchange with our Indigenous and non-Indigenous peers and audiences. And as you say, uh, Andre, we, we're relatively new. We were incorporated in April of 2019, um, officially. Um, but we, uh, and I was hired in 20, March of 2020, which everybody will remember is the beginning of the lockdown for the pandemic. And so um, as a result, um, everything was done for a number of years, for a number of years, until May of 2021, when we opened our first exhibition with Tahari Hulan, uh, also known as Michelle Savard. And we've been continuing, um, we've continually continually programmed exhibitions uh, since that time, our most recent one being um, Bebeka with artists uh, Christian Chapman, Carrie Allison, and Matt Vaxen. Um, do you want me to just keep going or do you? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, are you always, at, uh, I think you are moving or is it uh, done? because you work on the Saint-Hubert uh, Street, uh, uh, that's where you open. And I uh, remember mm -hmm. I have seen a few exhibitions there, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh, now you are coming close to Terre en Vue. We are really happy to have you in the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, as almost a, a neighbor. Correct. We um, we are moving. Um, we haven't exactly announced where we're moving to yet, but uh, but we're we're going. We are going close to where you are. Um, we we um, the we love that little space on on Rue Saint Hubert. Um, but we always knew that it was going to be a little bit too small, um, and we uh, sort of. Um, 
came to the conclusion that, that 2023 would be the year for us to move um, into a new space. So we are going to be a significantly larger space in a significantly larger space where um, with um, two exhibition spaces and an artist studio so that we'll be able to do residencies in-house. And then also we'll have a, um, a space that's like a multifunction space um, for um, to be able to bring people together. And um, so we'll have Daphne Beads Perler Parlay in that space. We'll also be able to have our board meetings when we meet in person and also just other community events and things like that. And we're also going to have a kitchen. And one of the things that we've always felt very strongly about it, Daphne, is that the intention is that we we are creating community, we're building relationships, and one of the ways that we do that is by having people come together and often have people come together um, over food, because um, as you know, that that's a way for us to sort of have conversations, but also share and um, and 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 bring people together in a really good way. And so that's how we sort of build on our knowledge. A lot of the things that, you know, and it's also, it's a ceremony, it's protocol um, for us to, to come together in this way. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll circle back a little bit and talk about the four women who started Daphne and one of the things that they did when they were starting that. And these four women were Hannah Claus, Nadia Mir, Skawanadi, and Carolyn Monet. And they, they started actually coming together to sort of um, make work together, to, to be, be together, to, to sort of talk about art. And, um, and they had all, m many of them had sort of carried along with them for a number of years, this idea of actually having a space, an artist run space where people could, you know, the work could be seen of contemporary artists, and then also that we could have work from, especially with artists from Quebec, but also across Canada. And so the idea was to sort of always, was to, to have people come together in a really good way. And so that's that's where we're going with, the, with this new space as well. And also you will be in the neighborhood of uh, many uh, galleries. So the, I suppose the, the Saturday afternoon, uh, you will be very busy because there is uh, always a crowd of uh, uh, arts uh, amateurs that are uh, doing uh, the, the visit of all the, the galleries. This is a kind of Saturday, each Saturday ritual. Uh, uh, we see it in uh, our building because on the first floor mm -hmm. there is uh, a lot of galleries and if you are in the same surroundings so certainly you will be part of this circuit absolutely and you know when we were on saint hubert we we did have um our our friends our mirror and articule down the street from us as well um but yes absolutely we'll be we'll be right in in the midst of it with a number of other artist run centers and and we're really looking forward to that as well because that's also sort of making connections and um you know, and and with 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 the other artist run centers, and that's really good. And Daphne is still quite young, and we're still trying to find our place. But but I think that um, you know we've started to um, make some partnerships and some co collaborations with people. And in this year, um, in 2023, one of the things that we're doing was is our first two um, collaborations. One is with Articule, where we're bringing an indigenous um, an emerging Indigenous curator to Montreal for a residency and they will build an exhibition from that which will either happen at Articule or at Daphne. And then um, later in the summer we're, we're, uh, we're partnering with Momenta 2023 and so we are having an exhibition um, well, it's a sort of residency again, and it was a following exhibition at Daphne that will be part of the uh, 18th, I think it's 18th uh, edition of Momenta as well. So we're, we'll feature the artist Meki Ottawa. And so they are going to be making an entirely new body of work um, based on the theme of, of Momenta this year. Uh, which is Masquerade. And um, so we're very looking forward to seeing what Meki will make and do in, in the context of having um, a nice uh, sort of six week uh, residency and then, and then an exhibition to follow in uh, early September into October. 
we are certainly uh, happy to hear that because uh, we know Mickey, we had, uh, uh, had several uh, collaborations with her, uh, mm -hmm. exhibition at the, the Guile during the, the festival. And uh, mm -hmm. she is also from the same community than uh, Alexandre. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, she is uh, dear to uh, our uh, hearts <laughs> Mickey. Okay. yeah it's really nice the way that we have we have friends in common in a really good way so <laughs> and uh, uh, pretty soon uh, we will be able uh, to bring our lunch uh, one place to another <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, because we have a, a kitchen here too oh good yeah so, uh, so uh, and uh, uh, right, uh, well, uh, the the uh, the first location was not that bad neither. We were just beside Armur, which mm -hmm. is a wow, fantastic uh, gallery with uh, many uh, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, talented uh, artists, and among them uh, several uh, Aboriginal artists like uh, Nadia Mir, uh, David Prism. So uh, it was also a good location, I suppose. It was a good location, and we and we also I forgot to mention we did we did we did um, partner with with Baca um, the Biennale Art uh, Contemporary Art Indigenous uh, exhibition in May of last year with the uh, with an exhibition we curated our own space, um, but we were sort of aligned with with Baca at Art Muir that. Um, for that, uh, and we we showed the work of um, Suzanne Morris at Métis, uh, living and working in Toronto, but from originally from Manitoba, and um, so it was really it was really nice because of course their theme for last year was land last year's exhibition was uh, land back, and so um, Suzanne's work was sort of her placing her body. Uh, in in sort of different landscapes and that sort of thing. So um, and a lot of it was based on uh, sort of her experiences of powwow and different land uses and the way the land has changed in Manitoba as well. So um, all of these things that I'm talking about are on our website. <laughs> so people can go to Daphne.art. It's a very easy website, I think, and um, and just look at some of the things that we've been doing and uh, we'll post as things move on, we'll post some more. <laughs> That's my... <laughs> uh, I was uh, somehow surprised when I saw Michel Savard as the first uh, artist uh, having an exhibition in Daphne, because knowing the, the founders and the vocation, I thought it would have been uh, very center on uh, experimental avant-garde uh, mm -hmm. arts. And all of a sudden, a very traditional jeweler was the, the, the first uh, uh, to, uh, to be uh, exhibited at uh, Daphne. Can you uh, uh, <laughs> we like explain to, to me? <laughs> we like to keep people on their toes. Um, one of the so the first year of programming came out of, of the Jajage project, which was um, had been something that had been put together by the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective, as it was called now, called Indigenous Curatorial Collective. And in the summer of 2018, I'm going to say, there was a curatorial tour put together by the ACC. Um, as part of that project in which a number of curators from across the country traveled around uh, Quebec in a, on a little tour of about 10 days in length. And um, because again, that was part of our idea of, of building relationships across the country, but also bringing um, curators and, and breaking across that, that Quebec border um, so that because there's always the the challenge of both sort of uh, language and and so it's really important was really important to the four co-founders that this be our first series of exhibitions was based on that curatorial tour that had happened a couple of years previously. Um, of course, COVID changed things a little bit, um, but the four there were four artists. Michelle Savard was always one of them. Um, the curator who had met Michelle. I was very, very interested in sort of working with him because of her 
sort of experience in British Columbia. Unfortunately, COVID happened. And so change, things changed a lot. We, some of the artists that we're going to show weren't able to do it. Some of the curators who were going to be working with the different artists weren't able to do it. So in the end, Hannah Claus and um, Michelle Savard worked together. And um, yeah, that's interesting that you call him a jeweler and don't think of him, didn't suggest didn't know thought that it would be more avant-garde than it was one of the nice things about um i think one of the good things that came out of the pandemic was the fact that we were all at in our home or in our studios and we were able to be very very um contemplative and and think through things through and one of but one of the things of course that happened was that you know we said to michelle we're going to have your exhibition uh you know in september of 2020 and then we moved it to december of 2020 and then we moved it to january and and then finally it happened in may of 2021 but the thing was that it was actually also a chance for for him to build a whole new body of work and so we put so and and he was doing that work with uh, Zachary von Sand and um, and sort of the, the sort of cross uh, historical uh, relationship that he has with that artist. Uh, so and then and then the 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 work the silver work that he made as well. Um, so I I I never I've always just thought of it as a contemporary practice, and I think that we always need to remember that. Um, and I, you know, I'm saying this, and it's so obvious to so many of us. But, but Indigenous people um, from any nation, territory, are so often put into the past, and we need to, we meet, we need to, you know, one of our our objectives is to help our audiences recognize that, um, you know, all of people are the people are still here, whether they're Anishinaabe, Wendaki, Genakaha, whatever, um, and there's and they have a contemporary practice, and they their practice may draw on silver or beads or or something, but they're bringing it into the present as well, and in, in a really good way. So, so that was uh, you know I think that there's sort of the the silver work, the multimedia work. Um, the painting, the different things that were brought into that exhibition uh, really positioned Michelle Savard in the present. Uh, speaking about you as a commissaire uh, also, uh, I saw you worked uh, uh, in, in your biography, I saw you worked with uh, Shelley Nero, which is a, a great artist and she is a filmmaker too, so we have uh, we know ours most of all uh, uh, because we have a uh, screen or films in uh, mm -hmm. in our uh, 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 Présence Autochtone Festival. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I would like you to, uh, to to speak about the collaboration with uh, Shelley you had uh, as a commissaire. I, I met I met Shelley uh, a number of years ago at Art Space in Peterborough and. Um, and when I did my doctorate, I wanted to be able to uh, work with Shelley as one of the people that I really wanted to sort of co-research with the idea of uh, cultural identity and art experience across people's lifetime. And one of the things that I did was I went to um, I went to Shelley's house in Brantford, and I um, I was sitting there and we were sort of getting ready, and she was making coffee and things like that. And I was looking at all the art on the walls in her in her kitchen, and and the rebel yell was rebel yells was there. And I was like, oh my lord, that's that picture, that, that photograph is there. How wonderful is that? And so um, so I continued to work on my doctorate and finish that up uh, eventually. And um, but I really really wanted to. Um, I'd been thinking about curation for a number of years, and so one of the things that I wanted to do was was I thought let's let's sort of put together an exhibition, cu curate an exhibition with that iconic image as the as the sort of primary image of the exhibition. And I worked with a friend who had curatorial experience, and we put together the Rebel Yells, that was an exhibition that happened at the FOFA Gallery in 2015. And then Shelley and I sort of just like continued to develop our friendship and move forward. And I did a small exhibition of her work at the uh, ACC conf gathering in Whitehorse, which you were at because I have photographs of you. And um, and so that was that. And then. Um, 
And then in 20, sort of over the next couple of years, then we talked about having a larger exhibition that we had actually hoped would travel, um, but that didn't happen, but it was at the Art Gallery of Peterborough. And um, it was, a, it was um, Shelley Nero, Women La Woman, Land Ri Woman Land River was the name of the exhibition. Um, and it was a really good chance to, to bring together work by Shelley Nero that, um, sort of highlighted all the different media that she works in. So we had film, we had some beadwork, which people were really surprised. Many people didn't know that she she was a beadwork artist. And in fact, actually, that was one of the things that we talked about is that she's been making beadwork since she was standing at her mother's side, you know, as a very young child. Um, she's also, a, you know, a photographer. I'm sure you know about her work and also a painter. So so we brought together a lot of the work that base, is based on things that sort of our con you know sort of come back and run through her work and one of which was uh this the the creation story of the sky woman and so there's that and then the, the way that it interweaves with her relationships with women her friends her family her daughters and her granddaughter as well and then the river part of it was the grand river of course because so much of Shelley's work is um, focused on that that river that she feels really, <clears throat> excuse me, very um, attached to and very much a part of the way the way that she thinks about her herself as an indigenous person, Haudenosaunee person, is that that river that you know is sort of um, was given to the to the Haudenosaunee people when they left New York State, but then the, the amount of space that they have is like shrinking and changing over time. And so um, so she photographs it a lot and it enters into her work often as well. Um, so we um, and the land, of course, is just her 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 ties to to six nations and and the fact that she 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 doesn't live on doesn't live at Six Nations, but she lives at Brantford. So there's always that really interesting sort of cross current that happens with her as well, where she's making work based in a space that's slightly set aside, but but still that you know the Niagara and 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 that whole sort of whole region of southwestern Ontario is still very much a part of her and very much a part of the work that she does in the way that she presents her work and so um so it was just really a wonderful opportunity to just build an exhibition around the things that really sort of speak to her as an artist and and it was all it wasn't a retrospective of course by any means but it was also just a a really a really good way to introduce the audience to to this work of this person who may you know is well known but not well enough known and that sort of thing so that's <laughs> that was my little part <laughs> um so uh, <laughs> and Shelley is really representative of uh, what we were speaking uh, a few minutes ago she is at the same time very traditional with the mm -hmm. meaning, a link with the, the, the tradition with her community, but also in her, uh, the way she presents her work, it's uh, really contemporary. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were uh, really preparing uh, your, uh, your place in the future, Daphne, uh, uh, centered by uh, working with her, surely. For well, sure, and oh, sorry, I was just going to say. No, that no, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. I think that one of the things that that we, you know, that one of the things that's becoming more and more important to Shelley, and it's it's always been something that she's been very involved with, because she's she says she absolutely loves like writing screenplays, and and so she works a long time on on building her films and things like that. So she's been making more films in the last few years as well, and um, and again, I'll put in a little plug for Daphne, but on March twenty eighth. Uh, at the Deceve Theater at Concordia, we're going to be Daphne is co-presenting with Post Image, um, Post Image Speaker Series, uh, the incredible 25th year of Mitzi Bearclaw, which we don't think has actually been shown in Montreal. Maybe I'm incorrect, and and you guys did, but. Um, so we're we're hoping that uh, we'll we'll fill that little theater with you know everybody who can possibly fit into it, and uh, to see this really it's it's a lovely film. It's it's funny in parts. It's uh, a little bit goofy. It's a little bit uh, sort of um, 
ad hoc, I guess, in some of the ways, but 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 beautifully, beautifully filmed and and really love a really truly lovely story as well. And very thoughtful and very, you know, in very much in, in Shelley's way of being a little bit funny and a little bit serious at the same time. Okay, you told us uh, March 28th. Yes, at Concordia, yeah, at in the Hall building, I suppose. No, in front. It, it's in the library building. Um, the library building on yeah. the Maison Neuve Boulevard. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So uh, please send us our all this information. We will yeah. get the words, and uh, yeah. we will. Uh, uh, but uh, for those who are listening to us, uh, please mark. Uh, March 28th by the evening on your uh, agenda because uh, that will be uh, is uh, Shelley will be there Shelley will be there ah, and she'll... great wow and I will be in conversation afterwards so well or something like that <laughs> okay great yeah. okay so uh, we have a scoop uh, at uh, the <laughs> in our podcast <laughs> and uh, <laughs> We will be happy to uh, announce uh, this uh, important event. And, uh, and Shelley is a funny woman, and the the, uh, the films she does also are. We we always uh, leave the room with us with smile uh, after uh, seeing her work. Also, the uh, uh, when I look at Daphne, I know uh, that uh, this is uh, uh, from Daphne Ajig that. Uh, the name was uh, given. So another great actress woman. And well, I have had just a short, very short <laughs> phone conversation with Daphne Ojig years ago. Mm -hmm. Because when we started Terres en Vue, we had also a magazine, an art magazine. Mm -hmm. And the very first edition we took a painting from uh, Daphne Ojig as the front page and uh, as the cover. And uh, the, I wanted to, uh, to have it, but it is on the upper shelves up there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, we have no ladder here, so I was not able to get it, but I remember it. And obviously to get the authorization to, to have it, I spoke to her and it was Wow, mm -hmm. you can feel the warmth uh, 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 she had and how she was a, not only a great artist, but a beautiful lady. So mm -hmm. I was really uh, amazed when I saw the name Daphne arrive uh, 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 with the, the, the new center. But uh, maybe you can speak about the link between uh, the, the, the uh, Artists Run Center in Montreal and Daphne Audrey. Okay, I'm just going to give you my one little Shelley Nero anecdote to do with Daphne Ojig as well before I tell you about Daphne Daphne. Um, Shelley told me that um, when she was a teenager, she saw Daphne Ojig uh, painting when um, Daphne Ojig did a series called um, basically of images of people living on the reserve. And, and Shelley told me that that was the first time that she'd ever actually seen an image of of herself of of you know in herself but in um in a way that she in a, in a world that she recognized and so that was really really important i think and that sort of speaks to the importance of daphne ojig and all across her very long career daphne um daphne ojig is daphne Sandra dar daphne is not named after daphne ojig but she's it's named in recognition of her uh, when the four co-founders came together and they were looking for a name for Daphne, they they went through lots of things and lots of ideas and some sort of serious and not so serious. But the idea was that um, as they were four women, that it felt uh, that it would be, you know, sort of they were sort of going through one day a sort of list of women's names and things like that. And Daphne was mentioned and it was the one that, that they decided on. Um, I think one of the things about you know that that's really great about it ha being are are having our our being named in recognition of Daphne Ojig is that um, that she was an artist who was 
sort of she she also did what we're hoping to do, which is to bring people together. And certainly in the um, in the when she was living in in working in Winnipeg, she was able to bring people together. Artists sort of gravitated to her space because she she sold and had art materials. She also had a little exhibition space, and sort of she was very interested in the the movement of uh, contemporary artists, indigenous artists. Um, moving forward in a, in a way in which their work would be recognized as contemporary artists and no longer placed in historical museums and natural history museums and things like that. And so it was really important for her to sort of develop that as a, as a way of for people's work to be recognized as, as important and, and sort of contemporary. Um, and also I just find that for, for myself, I think about Daphne Ojig as a person who was an art educator and she always went, she went back many summers to Manitoulin Island and, and did art classes in the summer times and she said that anybody can be an artist from like a very young child into adulthood and it's and it's a really good positive expression of, of sort of being able to sort of like think through who you are and what you do and and how you are in the world and certainly she for herself she she's you know she was the, of that generation of people who who left the reserve and sort of left that part of their lives and their their sense of who they were as a person as an indigenous person oh you know and tried to move away from that but she said it was coming back to the island and and going into powwow and uh and and sort of recognizing the importance of her cultural connections and so that's you know, that's sort of in a nutshell, that's kind of my sort of potted history of why we're called Daphne. <laughs> and also she was a trailblazer because I remember, and I am old enough for that, uh, in, the, 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 uh, in the 60s, in the 70s, the, uh, when we were speaking about Aboriginal arts, people were looking at us and, mm -hmm. oh, you mean craft? You know, it was not considered an art, and she was really a trailblazer, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Norval Morisseau or Alex Janvier, that uh, mm -hmm. finally uh, uh, broke that uh, uh, prejudice that was uh, 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 marginalizing uh, indigenous arts mm -hmm. as uh, uh, something uh, folkloric that uh, has no meaning in the in the contemporary world, and uh, and she was doing it in a, a very smooth way. She was not <laughs> uh, she was not aggressive at all. She was uh, really uh, and also it's when you look at her work, it's there is a lot of happiness of uh, of joy uh, uh, in it, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, she, uh, this is a legacy, an important uh, legacy she mm -hmm. she left. And uh, well, I am uh, uh, really proud that we have uh, her remembered in, uh, in Montreal mm -hmm. with, uh, with the, the, the new uh, art center. And uh, I see also that uh, in uh, 2023, you are working on uh, 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 an exhibition with a woman too, right now. Oh, for myself? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll put my other hat on. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, that, that's our podcast with a lot of us. <laughs> are, uh, I, I, have, <laughs> I have an ongoing uh, uh, curatorial project that's happening at um, Maison de Culture Montreal of Montreal. Um, it's been an exhibition that's traveled um, sort of around the island oh, since June of 2022. Um, it, the exhibition is called Inatawa, which is, means to hear, understand her in a certain way. There are four women artists in this exhibition. Um, Hannah Claus, Jobina Badanaquat, Uroma Washish, and Gaia Tanuru Dumoulin Bush. And each of those artists um, it's have put work into it that actually speaks to their own sense of uh, who they are as Indigenous people, and also I find that the 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 work that has gone into that exhibition also speaks to um, their way of working, also, and uh, so so it's been really interesting to sort of have this exhibition go into different spaces across the city, and um, 
And the next version of that is uh, coming to Jean, uh, Maison de Culture Janine Suto at uh, Metro Frontenac in um, March. It opens on March 18th. And so there's that. Um, and so it's really, it's, I, I love the idea of the, the Maison de Culture in, in the city, just they're they're sort of like hidden gems. Uh, I hope it's okay to say that they're hidden, but but you but they're 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 just also they are they are they are neighborhood hubs, and um, you know when when this exhibition was at Park Extension in the autumn, it was it was in a place that um, one I didn't know where it was previously, <laughs> um, but it was also just um, it's it's in this space where. You know, there's a library, there's lots of kids coming through, there's after school programming, there's uh, French as a second language, um, sort of for people who are new to this country. And so it's just really nice to be able to introduce an entirely different audience, mostly, to, to contemporary Indigenous art. And so I'm, I'm really, really very pleased and very proud of this exhibition. And I'm super happy that those four artists also said that they would be. Uh, you know, part of this, part of this ongoing year long process. <laughs> and I guess I could tell you about my other little project that I've been doing with um, my, my community at Hiawatha. Um, in 1860, the Prince of Wales did a tour of Canada. And um, he, one of the, he was a very young man, he was only 18 years old at the time. And he so in started out in July of 1860 and traveled all the across lower and upper Canada or Canada East and West was called then. Um, and they, he, he visited some in, indigenous communities um, at that time. And so one of the one, ones that he came to was a, a Rice Lake village, which is, became Hiawatha First Nation. And at that time he was given uh, quilled birch bark baskets that, that were made by the women and they've been, I saw them in 2016, and they've been um, sort of in in England since since that time. And I think I might be one of the few people who are members of Hiawatha First Nation to have ever seen them. And so I did some um, sort of uh, knowledge building about the about quilled baskets in in the community in 2016 and then I've just been moving this project forward and working with another co-curator named Laura Pierce who has experience of bringing uh, indigenous objects to to Canada for a visit and so so these uh, quilt baskets historic baskets will be coming macaques will be coming from England in April of this year to the Peterborough Museum and Archives. And we've been working with, um, there's six Mississauga nations in, in Ontario. And um, so each of them will be very much involved in this, in this exhibition and we'll be doing lots of programming related to it, um, quill workshops and um, language work and uh, lectures on the history of Mississauga and the crown relations, because these were, these were these gifts are coming for a visit. Um, they were gifts. They were sovereign to sovereign or nation to nation gifts given with the understanding that um, that the 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 Mississauga of, of Rice Lake were were a strong and independent people, um, and they they had their own relationship with the crown. And so so we're 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 creating a catalog and we're talking about these things, but but we're very very pleased that to be able to bring these. Um, 13 macaques for for a, an extended visit uh, uh bringing the ancestors home for for seven months for an exhibition in peterborough wow that's a great project and uh wow the, i think it will be very uh, moving for the people to have mm -hmm. uh, those very ancient uh, objects that mm -hmm. are related to the uh uh, the, the ancestral uh, knowledge. Wow, that's mm -hmm. uh, wow. I hope I uh, could have the opportunity to go to Peterborough. <laughs> to well, see that. Yeah, I think we should do like a bus tour. Yes, <laughs> we'll sure. From the to, <laughs> to Peterborough. <laughs> yeah, well, let's talk about it. We will. Uh, we will do it. That's okay. a good idea. <laughs> uh, then uh, it brings us to well, Mrs. Soga. I can. Uh, 
understand uh, Mississauga uh, uh, Great Lake. Right? It's uh, the, the the origin of the the name. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, what sounds strange to me is that your community also is called Ayawata, <laughs> and Ayawata is a character in uh, uh, the history of the the. the uh, uh, Iroquois Confederacy, mm -hmm. and, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and also I know that Longfellow has a poem, right? the song yeah. of Ayawata, and I was wondering how come uh, uh, your, community, your community got Ayawata uh, uh, as, uh, as a name. Well, that's that. Apparently, the 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 anecdotal story is that the when the Prince of Wales was coming across the Atlantic, he was unwell, and and so his doctor, uh, Doctor Ackland, read him uh, Longfellow's Hiawatha, and uh, so when they so he came he came from what is now newfoundland all the way through the eastern provinces to to montreal and the idea was that he was coming to open the queen victoria bridge or yeah the victoria bridge and then they brought him up and they brought him across uh to from coburg up and he was meant to go up in towards peterborough and a little bit further north um on the on the railway that had been built from uh, coburg to to peterborough and they built it in 1857, as usual. Nobody asked the indigenous people of Rice Lake, you know, how this bridge would, this railway bridge would survive the winters and things like that. And because they didn't sort of recognize that the scientific knowledge, the the, the sort of land knowledge that, that the indigenous people who of, of that territory and of that land, um, but no, would understand, and so as a result, the bridge, of course, didn't didn't last because the the winter ice and things like that pushed the bridge and everything like that. So, uh, so when the prince arrived with his entourage, uh, they said, "No, we're not going on that bridge because it's it's not going to it's not steady. It's not going to work." And so, so they brought him across by canoe. And uh, another anecdotal story is that supposedly they gave him the canoe. And when I went to the Isle of Wight in 2016, they said, uh, ask them about the, the, the chief and council knew I was going. And they said, ask them if they've got that canoe still. There is no canoe in the Isle of Wight. But anyway, um, but anyway, they brought him across Rice Lake on in a canoe and um and the story goes that as he as he sort of was approaching the village, he said, "It is the it is the very you know the very essence of of, Hi of Hiawatha Village." And so then you know <laughs> we never get to choose our own names, right? But <laughs> so um, so that's the the name stuck, and so it became Hiawatha First Nation, which you know everybody everybody says you know that's sort of. Um, you know, it's just it's just the way that it does it. You know, the way that the way it, it sort of colonizers think about things is that they don't re recognize that there's different nations, and so, so they just sort of co-opted. Um, on you know, over recently, I was sort of also hearing that um, you know that that uh, that Longfellow was really interested in the Anishinaabe people as well, and so so there may be some sort of cross currents between. You know, um, Nishinaabe and and Haudenosaunee people as well, and in the telling of that story. So I I don't know for sure, but that's <laughs> that's that's the short the, the anecdotal history of why it's called Hiawatha. <laughs> well, it's it's a mix after a mix because uh, what I know is Longfellow took uh, grab here and there uh, indigenous names and put it uh, in uh, his uh, poem and in his works without uh, checking uh, uh, where it come from and uh, the, the, the historic uh, reality of it. Mm -hmm. So he mixed uh, everything in uh, his literary blender. And, exactly. uh, <laughs> so, and the Prince of Oil arrived and is mixed by the, 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 the uh, Longfellow's a uh, mistake in uh, in in its work in his work and <laughs> that's really funny <laughs> and i suppose i slake uh, refer to uh, wild rice this is the the region yes it did yes yes and there's um 
one of the, you know, one of the, again, it, that was, that was, that was summer grounds was at, was at Rice Lake. And so, um, but when the reserve was, um, the treaty was signed uh, in 1818, that was, that became the reserve land uh, was at, was on Rice Lake. And previous to that, they, they traveled sort of north and up through the Corthes and in, basically into the Halliburtons. And um, so, and, and yes, it was, it was, that was, you know, for, they went, they went through, through the summer and into the early autumn for, for fishing and for, for the wild rice. Um, when the Trent Severn waterway was built, the, the water levels ro rose. And so that was the end of the wild rice. There's certainly an effort um, with people at Curve Lake and uh, wh which is another nearby um, Mississauga nation um, to revive revive the the sort of industry of of wild rice um, on the different lakes and things like that. And um, I know I had heard recently that, or in the last few years, that there was a uh, a sort of a project because it's the hundredth anniversary of the Williams Treaty and that was signed in nineteen twenty three this year, and um, there was a project to to sort of plant, replant uh, wild rice into, into Rice Lake, um, you know, but that's, I don't, I don't really know for sure whether that's actually how that project has moved forward or not, but, but that's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, part of, part of the history of the village and, and, um, and certainly of the area and, but, but there's not much wild rice and wild uh, rice lake right now anymore. <laughs> uh, also, if we go back in the, our conversation, uh, I forgot because I, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge the, the great work the Maison de la Culture in Montreal are doing, and especially the animateurs and the people uh, that mm -hmm. are programming at, in the Maison de la Culture. They are, they really believe in what they are doing, and mm -hmm. uh, especially this uh, Parc Extension, uh, where they have a long name like that, uh, mm -hmm. the Maison de la Culture, uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, this is a very multicultural place, uh, we had an exhibition with, uh, oh, years ago with uh, uh, Alanis Bonsawin Prince and uh, Christine uh, Siwiwanalo at Sculptures. And uh, uh, it circulated through different Maison de Culture and the one in part extension too. And it was a great experience, exactly what you <laughs> described when people from uh, other countries that are not that are discovering uh, the, 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 the uh, new country and how they have uh, this uh, very special connection when uh, they are in contact with the uh, uh, arts that uh, is uh, related to the, the peoples of the land. That's really a great experience. Okay. And uh, also, uh, what's coming up for uh, uh, Daphne? You will be in a new location with, I suppose, a new, brand new ex exhibition. What yes. it will be? Well, um, a, a sneak preview is that one of the first exhibitions that we'll be doing at Daphne uh, when we reopen and when our renovations are finished is we're, um, we're having a co-founders exhibition. So that will, that will sort of launch our summer programming. And uh, we have a we have a fully packed year of programming set for uh, for this year. We're we're also um, at the same as I said. We have two. We'll have two exhibition spaces. So we'll have the co-founders exhibition, and then we're having um, an exhibition of a an emerging uh, artist uh, named Teresa Benjamin Chasse, and. Um, Teresa's work. Teresa is Upper Tanana from Beaver Creek, Yukon, and on the Alaska border. And so she's developing work that's part of her just finishing the work of her Master of Fine Arts at Concordia. And so her exhibition will be up, and it'll run at the same time as um, as the co-founders exhibition. And then we're sort of we're sort of 
through the year, we're kind of pairing um, artists with who are emerging at, or early career with with more established artists. So we've got a really good, strong. I hope I can say strong uh, year of programming uh, set for 23 into 2024. We have this funny thing where our programming year seems to start in May, just because of the sort of ongoing impact of the pandemic and everything. But so, so I always think of my school year as starting in May now. So. <laughs> okay. So we expect uh, your uh, 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 Daphne in uh, its brand new location to open in May. Yep. <laughs> okay. <Thank So>. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Alexandre, do you have uh, something to uh, to add? Ah, we uh, we had to remember also that uh, the uh, uh, exhibition uh, to to be seen will be at uh, the Maison de la Culture Janine Suto, who was previously Maison de la Culture Frontenac. Mm -hmm. uh, right, right on the uh, uh, exit of uh, the uh, Frontenac metro station. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we will also spread the word that, that uh, this exhibition uh, is uh, a must for uh, uh, if we want to uh, keep connect with uh, the indigenous cultural life in Montreal. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alexandre, est-ce que tu as quelque chose à rajouter? Do you have something to add? Well, uh, I have my word for the week. Uh, it was really, I think it's, uh, it was harder than than last week because uh, it's difficult to translate this word and thus find the right word to uh, to find. Uh, you said to me that uh, in Itawa it was um, Nishinaabe Mwen. But at first, I thought it was uh, Mohawk, Mohawk language, because just if you read this, I'm not sure that's an Anishinaabemwin. So, but I, I look for this word, and uh, I, this is what I found. Let me show you. So you told me this it's come, uh, it comes from... Um, Anishinaabe language, Anishinaabe Mwin. Mm -hmm. And it says that in Itaw, it's that's the full vowel, uh, vowel form. So I think that in Itaw, it's, it's like for the, the plural form. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in Itaw, see, hear, some, uh, uh, hear somebody in a certain way, have somebody sound a certain way to one. Nitagzi, uh, be heard saying something, what is said, what also stated, say something. Nitam, uh, it's, um, it's, um, it's the same word as uh, in Itao. There's something in a certain way. Have things sound a certain way to one. So for me, it's, well, it's really hard to find these words. So I just look for here, something. And in Atskemek, Nyarumwen, we would say Editagzio speak in a certain way, have mm -hmm. a certain tone of voice. Mm -hmm. uh, sound to, uh, to sound so, to, ma uh, to make such a sound or to make a certain noise. Editum, see, hear something like this. Uh, the difference, like editagun, editagun, that's the, the object that it sounds like. Editum, someone is hearing something. Uh, plain scree, Edita well, she hears some someone does. Editum, she hears something does. So this is um, for someone, Editum is something. Is it our is it our uh, he understands someone? Is it um, he hears something? Edita Guzio sounds like a at schemic here. He sounds like uh, he sounds uh, such sound. He has heard thus. Editagun says that that's the object. Naskapi, editim, she hears a certain sound. Editwa, she, uh, she hears some someone say a certain thing. Editagno, uh, editagno, it is heard in a certain way. 
in it wow she hears someone who sounds like people uh the only difference i have seen is this word comes from uh, eu which uh, literally mean the a, per, uh, a person moves in swapping re edit them imagine something so uh this is the first time i see this imagine it's like imagining something that you hear there's something who so or someone edit were edit were understand someone so take someone in such a way in in my mind, they would say he did well she hears uh, him she hears her he did he did them she hears it in a certain way and eastern Cree here in in, in quebec idatum she hears it so it sounds so to him he did well she hears it um, in a certain way or seven quid to work so mostly it's like the same word over and over that we hear so <laughs> and i found that in ojibwe in itan here understand it in a certain way in itao her in her in a certain way in itagwad in itagwad it is heard it is understood in a certain way in itaguzi she uh she is heard in a an, understood in a certain way so i wouldn't think that this is uh, is from uh, nishnabem win but after looking for all these words i understand it now Nick, but, uh, that is fascinating thank you so much <laughs> that's great it's uh, really hard to uh, like see the little differences mm -hmm. in each language so for me uh I think it will be hard to learn all this language because it resembles so much for um, for my own. So for me, it's like uh, okay, uh, there's no specific uh, logic between these uh, dialects. It's mm -hmm. just between the uh, uh, little differences between. It is also interesting to see that uh, the two jugglers inanimate and animate commands uh, uh, the uh, conjugation of the uh, of the verbs right that's mm -hmm. so that's one of the complexity of the uh, indigenous uh, language grammar right? very very complex and uh, 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 if uh, I remember when uh, the, uh, uh, the they were uh, teaching uh, Latin in the college in Quebec. I was oh, very very young, and I then and I was already a, a, a bad guy. I was telling why don't we learn Algonquin? It would be <laughs> as good as the Latin as a, a mental exercise because it was supposed to uh, give us the uh, the ability uh, to uh, to think uh, uh, with the complexity to learn the classical latin which was true but it would have been even better with uh, an indigenous language and it, and it would have connected with this land and not with uh, the, the the european antiquity okay that was my editorial for today <laughs> uh, yeah, thank uh, you. i'm i'm pretty sure that if if we learn cree plains cree ojibwe and at i'm pretty sure that we can understand our language every every cree language in, in canada mm. well oh mm. Algonquin language because uh, there is also uh, other. Uh, it won't help you to Iroquois or uh, West Coast language or Inuktitut if you uh, learn uh, Cree and Atikamek. But mm -hmm. it's another story. Uh, we will have uh, the opportunity to discuss languages in the other podcast. So please uh, follow us each uh, Wednesday. This is uh, our weekly rendezvous uh, with a fantastic person uh, that are that keep the uh, Aboriginal cultures 
uh, alive and uh, well alive uh, in uh, Canada and in Montreal, like uh, our guest today, Laurie. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward uh, to uh, all uh, those uh, events, the exhibition at uh, Janine Suto, the film at Concordia, and uh, the exhibition in the new location of uh, uh, Daphne. Miigwech, Dari. Well, so uh, see you next week. Uh, Matashik Skina.